Let's get started. Welcome to everybody to the third annual ParLab Boot Camp. And everything I say will eventually be posted on the web page, although having just finished the slides, they're not quite there yet. So I'm Jim Demmel, and I'm going to give you a little bit of organizational material before Kubi, the first lecturer, starts speaking. I'll tell you a little bit about the motivation and goals. And there are actually a lot of other resources for those of you who want to learn more about parallel computing or computational science. It's not just this one three-day course. And there are a lot of other things I want to tell you about so you know how to follow up afterwards. I'll tell you about the schedule and the instructors, a little bit about the logistics, important things like where's the coffee, and a little bit about you. So I think we know where, why we're all here. Parallel computing is becoming ubiquitous. The only way your programs will ever run faster than they did in 2008 is if you figure out how to make them run in parallel. Uh, parallel programming is still a lot harder than sequential programming. And even though there are a lot of people working on better tools to make it easier to program in parallel, as easy as sequential programming, not that that's always easy, in the meantime, people have to get trained to do parallel computing. So that's why we're all here. So there are two particular events that have occurred here recently that uh, I want to tell you about that both create a lot of resources for, uh, for research and also for education in, in uh, parallel computing. One of them is the ParLab, which was established a couple of years ago with generous industrial funding from Intel and Microsoft. It's basically a research center about the multi-core revolution, the fact that we all now have to program in parallel. I'll say a little bit about that. And also a new graduate program in computational science and engineering here at Berkeley with 117 faculty from 22 departments, all of whom signed up because they agree that their students need to learn about how to do computing for either simulation or analyzing large-scale databases. And that's another resource I'll tell you a little bit about. So what are our goals? Teach the basics about parallelism, how to program, including a hands-on lab. And so there'll be an hour of that this afternoon and three hours of it tomorrow afternoon, although, of course, in four hours, you're not going to learn all that you need to know tools that you can use now, simple ones, they run in many, many places, but also a bunch of ones that we're building ourselves and that other people are building and that are advanced and a little insight into our ongoing research because there's some really neat stuff going on that will be available soon. So let me start off with the PAR Lab, which has about 15 faculty and uh, was it 70 uh, graduate students and staff who sit in Soda Hall, work on parallel computing. And so let me give you a little background about how it started because that's going to influence the educational process. So our research actually influences our education quite a bit. So a number of years ago, a colleague, Phil Colella at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, where they do lots of high performance computing, looked at all of the different large scale parallel simulations they did for science and engineering and said, well, what are they really, what are they really all built of? And he said, they're really only seven kernels, seven computational kernels. And if you understood how to make them run in parallel and go fast and be able to compose them with one another, you could basically do all the science and engineering that they do up at LBL. And so here are the seven, he called them, since they're seven, he called them seven dwarfs because it's sort of a small amount of intellectual stuff you have to keep in your head. So they were operations on structured grids, and, and you'll hear more details about this later. I don't want to go into it all right now. Operations on dense matrices, on sparse matrices, Fourier transforms and things that look like Fourier transforms. Particle methods, that means pushing particles around under the force of gravity where they all influence one another unstructured grids in Monte Carlo. So, okay, so that was what he said, this was like 2004 or so. That's good enough for science and engineering, but, but there's more to the world in science and engineering. And if you want to make every program run in parallel, you have to say, are these enough patterns? So what the faculty here began to do is they asked themselves, well, okay, what about other things? Not just HPC, high performance computing, what about CAD, computer-aided design, or machine learning, or building games, or databases, or spec benchmarks, which is this long list of benchmarks that Silicon Valley companies use to measure how fast their machines go, or embedded computing, you know, little handheld devices you know, embedded in things. Which patterns, which are, the, are these seven good enough? So we embarked on this enterprise where we took apart a lot of these different applications from all these different areas, and we asked, well, are these things, are these seven okay, or are there more? And we discovered that there were 13. There were 13 patterns that occurred over and over again. And since it's not seven anymore, they're, we call them motifs, although there are actually 13 dwarfs in The Hobbit, but we don't want to you know, marry, marry ourselves to the literature like that. So anyway, we call them motifs now. And so what, what, in addition to those ones I mentioned before, there's finite state machines, there's circuits, there's operations on graphs, graph traversal. 
dynamic programming, which is, you know, if you've had an algorithms class, that should be familiar. Uh, backtracking, bran branch and brown search. Graphical models is kind of a catch-all term for a lot of different artificial intelligence techniques. And, and Monte Carlo is still there. So what does this picture mean? The red squares mean that that particular uh, pattern, like sparse matrices, appears a lot in games, believe it or not. I'll probably show you a video of it later. Uh, of a, of a best-selling game that does a lot of parallel sparse matrix computations. And orange is its kind of important. Green is maybe not so important. So we use this as kind of a, a starting point to say, what are the patterns that we have to capture, not just in our software, but we need to teach people to understand how to recognize previously solved problems so when they start to parallelize their code, you know, they don't solve problems that have been solved before. And so what we did in the PAR lab is we chose five applications not from high performance computing, to sort of use to drive our construction and understanding of which patterns matter. So there was a browser, a web browser. There was music, so what's the killer app there? You have a speaker hanging from your ceiling. It can do beam forming and a lot of signal processing and make your living room sound like Carnegie Hall, if you want it to sound like Carnegie Hall or the Greek theater, whatever. Um, there's speech, so that uh, in a meeting like this, you could come with your little cell phone and it would have a model of your voice, and it would get my model of my voice from my cell phone, and it would create a, uh, a diary of who said what when, and have it all translated to know that one speaker went to a, when, when one speaker spoke and when a different one spoke. But this is understood partially how to do, but you need a lot of high performance computing to do it. Uh, oops, sorry. Image processing. So you, so you say, here's a picture of my sister. Please find me all the other pictures of my sister standing with her friend. And it goes off and searches databases to do that for you. And then there's also health. And that is actually kind of a high performance computing application. There the application is a stroke victim comes into a hospital. What do they do now? Almost nothing because they don't know how long ago the stroke occurred. But if you took a CAT scan of the person's brain, found where the actual clot occurred and did a fluid dynamic simulation of what would happen if you put in blood thinner, then they could treat people. So, but you have to do it awfully quickly because you don't have much time after the patient arrives. So that's another application to do you know, fluid dynamic simulations of stroke victims. So this is all the kind of stuff that we're using to drive the lab. But uh, I only have 12 on this list. What happened to Monte Carlo? That's sort of missing. So it's because we continually explore what patterns we need. And this is a very busy slide. I'm not expecting you to read it all. But it sort of reflects a later lecture into which patterns we have discovered by looking at different applications. So here are the 12 I mentioned before. Monte Carlo has been renamed MapReduce, because that's really what it is. It's sort of this, you do a bunch of independent operations and a bunch of independent data, and then you collect it all by adding it up or putting it in one place. And MapReduce is just a more widely used buzzword for that kind of activity. But there are all these different levels of patterns which we are continually re revamping and trying to make available in software so it's easier for you to program and recognize. And there's going to be lectures on this later. So this is just sort of an introduction to how our research is affecting education and what you'll hear later. Let me go on now and talk about this new graduate program in computational science and engineering. And when I began you know, this a few years ago, I sent email to a few colleagues in like astronomy and mechanical engineering who I knew did large scale computing. And I said, would you be interested in having a formal program to train your students on this? And by the time it was done and people heard about it, we had 117 faculty sign up from 22 departments all of whom agree that they need to train their students in all of these different things. And, and from, from departments that, frankly, surprised me would be interested in political science, for example. There are two participants from political science. So I'll just tell you a little bit about that. And there's a whole website with more details about it. So it's a new graduate minor. And I already told you the motivation. It's a very low uh, uh, level of bureaucracy for a university. Basically, you're already a graduate student in an existing department. You decide you want a minor in this. It's just a minor. And then if you do that, there are a few courses you have to take. There are three courses. Most graduate programs require you to take an outside minor of three courses. We have a list of them. And your qual has to ask something about computational science, and your thesis should have something to do with it. And then when you graduate, you get your PhD in whatever home department you're in with a designated emphasis, Berkeley Talk for Graduate Minor in Computational Science and Engineering. So it's sort of a low overhead activity. And just to give you a sense of the breadth, I have two slides just to list all the departments who are signed up. And in red, how many faculty from that department, so seven astronomers, three bioengineers, and how many courses they offer currently in that department that are computational science related. So there are three different astronomy courses that have to do with large-scale analysis. Well, they either you know, 
do simulations of supernova, that kind of thing, or they take uh, sky samples from many you know, radio telescopes and they try to analyze it and look, look for data. So there are all sorts of different activities going on. And as I mentioned, there's political science. So why is that? Um, there are two faculty members there, uh, Henry Brady and Jazjeet Second. So Henry Brady was in the news a lot during the 2008 elections because he had these big databases of sociological data trying to explain why people vote one way or another. So analyzing those sort of sociological databases. And Jazjeet does agent-based simulation of large social situations, trying to predict why, how large groups of people make decisions, also a large-scale computing problem. So one of the main courses in this, in this designated emphasis is the one-semester version of this three-day course. It's called CS267. And you can go to that web page and look for it. It's taught every spring. It's webcast, just like this one is. In 2009, we webcast it to four different campuses, so students at a bunch of other uh, uh, Citrus campuses got credit for it. So let me do a little experiment here, see if this works. So let me type in parallel computing course. I'm feeling lucky. And you get the 1996 version of this course. So, so why is that? I don't know how Google makes up its mind. But, but you know, this, there's basically a free online textbook that I wrote in raw HTML. I will never do that again. But, uh, so we continually update it. And, and so I invite you to go look at this stuff. OK. So here's some, so the, the class is mostly project-based. And um, we, all the posters and video of people presenting their posters are on the web page. Here are a few of the interesting ones, kind of projects that people did in it. Some of them are related to Parlab activities. One of them was this image recognition one where you hand the system a picture and say, find me other pictures of the person in this picture. How do you extract features quickly and then go match those features to features in other uh, pictures in a large database? Someone from biomechanics did faster molecular dynamics and tried to use it to sort of analyze uh, proteins that come up in Alzheimer's disease. There is a speech recognition improving that so that we can have a diarizer, something that takes minutes from a meeting like this by making the inference engine, the little AI piece that recognizes words run faster. Uh, genome sequencing, similar kind of thing, making that run faster. And uh, the last one was a really interesting undergraduate project because we had a bunch of undergrads take it too. And here was their motivation. You're, you're, you're trying to play a game in your cell phone. You don't have enough bandwidth. You're standing around with a bunch of your friends. They all have cell phones. They have bandwidth. You can add it all together. How do you parallelize the game across all the cell phones you can use all the bandwidth? I think they got a call from a venture capitalist when that was over, but I can't remember what happened. So anyway, there's all sorts of interesting projects that come out of this class. So in computational science and engineering, we have lots of people to talk to. It's, they're all listed on the website. We're continually producing new courses. We have, and I'll, I'll have one slide to list the, the other new courses. We have money from the campus and from uh, industry to create these new courses. We have lots of computing resources that you can use, cloud computing, startup allocations from the supercomputer center uh, right next door, which I'll tell you about. And then, in fact, I should tell you about the supercomputer center right next door, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which I will. And our first speaker is here, so good. So here are, here are the list of new courses that are being offered for the first time this semester. In fact, one of them is a three-day short course on Python programming for scientists. What are all of the different you know, scientific you know, tools that are already built into Python that can be used for large-scale simulation? That's going to be offered next week for three days. And then there's going to be a full uh, semester course on that. Um, molecular simulation, these two guys have a widely used textbook on doing molecular simulation, which is popular among many students and, and many departments, and so they're going to be teaching that again, and they're going to try to uh, use a lot of parallel MATLAB tools to, in order to make it run fast. Uh, similar thing in earth sciences, in that case, all of the, it's, it's large-scale simulation and data sets have come out of, you know, earth science, either, you know, the earth or other planets. Um, optimization methods in engineering, you know, how do you do maximize and minimize things, again, you know, generally applicable algorithms. And there are many other courses that have been proposed, and we're sort of in the constant process of developing these. So finally, let me say that there is not just the campus. There is a very large Department of Energy National Laboratory right next door, uh, which is Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They run one of the largest supercomputers uh, in the country for unclassified research. And you're going to be doing your homework on that supercomputer for this particular uh, course. So they have many, many users from all over the country, you know, thousands of users and projects, lots of publications, covers of, of, you know, large, of you know, significant science journals come, come from it. 
And they're about to install one of the world's largest machines there. It's, it's called Hopper, named after Grace Murray Hopper. It'll be one petaflop, sort of, that's sort of the, the next sort of threshold to get, one 10 to the fifth floating point operations per second. And uh, this is one of the platforms that we'll be using for, for the homework. Not the petaflop machine, so we will be using these two machines for the homework. One of them is called Franklin. It's a 38, has 38,000 cores in it. You won't necessarily use all 38,000 for your homework, but you can use some fraction of them. Uh, they come clustered into four core uh, Opteron multi-core chips. You might just use a single or a couple of those chips for your homework, and so there's about 9,500 of those, and it, it's about a third of a teraflop. You might also use the first version of Hopper, which has uh, been installed. It has 5,000 cores, and it's going to scale up next year to be the petaflop machine. There's lots of other facilities there, too, which I mention only because if you're on the Berkeley campus, this is available to you depending on the project that you want to run. They also, in addition to the supercomputer center, have a large group of scientists, many of whom are world leaders, National Academy members, who work on doing large-scale simulations. So I'll just mention, draw this one picture because this is due to Phil Colella, who was elected to the National Academy recently for his work in adaptive mesh refinement, you know, doing simulations where you make the meshes smaller because you want to resolve, say, exactly what's going on at the front of the flame. And their motivation is, 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 is energy efficiency. How do you understand the inside of an internal combustion engine to make it burn fuel more efficiently? So it's not just pure science. They're very motivated to use energy more efficiently. So they teach their own courses. In fact, this year we managed to schedule our short courses at the same time. We don't want to do that again, but uh, let me just mention they're teaching a short course on the 17th through the 20th of this week on, on high-performance computing tools, things like Scalapack, Pepsi, Hyper. Some of those we'll mention briefly, too. Um, and you should feel free to visit their website, but they're booked up. And they just finished teaching a course on GPU programming, and they're going to offer that every six months. And so we're going to coordinate with them next time for the next time it's offered in the spring. And you can think of this course as basically a prerequisite to their much more detailed GPU programming course that they're going to offer probably in January. So finally, let me get to the detailed logistics for this. So I have three slides with the schedule. So here I am. I'm giving you the introduction and welcome. Kubi, who's standing here in, uh, in the wings, is going to tell you all about parallel architectures in some detail and then pthreads programming. And then we will have lunch. And there's a web page for suggested venues. We, we will not provide it, but there's lots of good places to eat around. Barbara Chapman will talk about uh, shared memory programming with OpenMP. Barbara has given many short courses in this before, and she's on the OpenMP committee, so she can give us maybe some insights as to what the future of OpenMP will bring us. Intel and Microsoft are our partners in ParLab, and they're producing a lot of their own tools. So we will hear the next two talks are from Intel folks talking about their own tools, which are particularly well optimized to run on Intel platforms. So Michael Wren will talk about TBB, and Mark Davis will talk about Parallel Advisor, which is about to be released. So it will be available in September, I understand, as a new tool to help you take sequential code, find the parallelism in it, and make it run fast. Then we'll have a little break, and uh, Raz von Karbanescu, the teaching assistant who's in the back there, will tell you a little bit about the logistics of the lab, how to get accounts, how to sign on, and then move, and for those of you who are doing the lab, you'll move across the street to the, uh, to 306 Soda and sort of begin work there. And then we'll have a party of, in, in the WAS at uh, 6 o'clock where we can all hang out. Tomorrow I'll start by, we're, we're going to talk more about these kind of patterns I was telling you about. So I'm going to talk about how to recognize patterns of parallelism and locality, which means keeping data in the same place so you don't have to move it very much in simulations of various kinds. Uh, Kathy Yellick will talk about parallel distributed memory programming in MPI and UPC, which are the standard ways that people program large distributed memory machines. Last time after our boot camp, we took a survey, and the one topic that everybody wanted us to add to the last boot camp was how do you debug this stuff, because it's really hard. And so we have uh, actually two lectures, one and a half lectures, on debugging. So Jacob Burnham will talk about the debugging tools that we have, and Parallel Advisor, Today, this afternoon, we'll also have some debugging content. Kurt Kreutzer will talk about the patterns, that very busy slide I told you about. There'll be a whole lecture on how to recognize, recognize those patterns in your applications. And then we'll have a three-hour lab tomorrow afternoon. And then finally, on Friday, I will come and tell you about the computational patterns that I, I alluded to, the, the seven dwarfs and a few others. It turns out that they're 
rather hard to write if you do it by hand. And so what people are doing is you, we don't write them anymore. We write programs that write them for us by searching over all possible reasonable implementations, picking the fastest one. It's called auto-tuning. And so I will talk about how these codes are written automatically. Um, then we'll, take, we'll say, how are all these tools that we've been talking about so far used in these real applications? How are they used in speech recognition and in you know, computer music and in the stroke application? So we'll have some short presentations on how all these tools are being used to build these applications. Then we'll close with a lecture on cloud computing, which is you know, a, you know, another flavor of parallel computing so that you have a sense that that's a big resource that's available. And we have donations from companies like Amazon to the campus for you to use that kind of stuff. Performance analysis tools, how do, if your code is running too slowly, how do you figure out where the bottleneck is? There are a lot of automatic tools for doing that. And we'll end with programming on GPUs, and which you can think of as, as a, uh, a uh, prerequisite or an introduction to the much more detailed uh, three-day boot camp on GPU programming that will be held by LBL in January. So the really important stuff, coffee. It's out there. It's not supposed to be in here. What can I say? That's the rule. So we're having a live webcast of all these lectures, and there's the website. If you're a remote listener, please email your questions to that website, and Roz Vaughn and the other GSIs will try to answer them by email or you know, raise their hands and ask the lecture. Um, we'll post all these lectures on the website eventually, you know, hopefully by the end of today. For the labs, it's uh, bring your own laptop. You, we will give you all the accounts. You need the wireless access and the accounts and the supercomputers. And here are the TAs who you'll meet this afternoon. And all the lab assignments are posted there. They've been used many times before. One thing we're doing differently this time than last time is we have the uh, assignments broken up into sort of for beginners and more advanced. So we'll divide into groups depending on your self-assessment. Are you a beginner? Are you more advanced? And you can work on the, on the assignments that you like. So what about you? There are 335 of you who registered this year, 152 on site, although some of you might be sleeping in. There are a few empty seats. Um, and 183 off-site, and the last time I had a chance to look at the data and sort it out, there were only 303, that was last Wednesday, about 86 were from companies, for, were from 36 companies, and there were 217 from university organizations of all different kinds from all over the world. So, welcome, and let's get started. Are there any questions before, while Kubi sets up? Okay, I'm glad it was all clear.